The times we lose our temper, the times we give in to temptation, the times we make selfish decisions, you know, that is not actually what keeps us from God. What keeps us from God is the way that we cover it up in our hearts, the way we hide from those truths. If you've not known that God is a God who loves to forgive, that's who he is, that's who Jesus is. So Jesus was, was sent to be a God who would forgive us. He loves us and he forgives us. And so what keeps us from him is not the sinful choices we make, it's the way that we cover it. And so this concept of circumcision, it was, it was about removing, removing the covering. Because that ultimately is what God needs from his people. We need to be people who are not trying to cover our sin ourselves, but instead to be united with God and to walk with him and to know him and have him know us and to not hide it. Well, good morning, everyone. I hope you're well. Yes, if we've not met, my name is Charlie. It's a pleasure to meet you. So, uh, thanks, Aaron. So when you walked in, we got these new posters that are actually pretty cool that have, what we, you know, our, our core values here at Westview. And one of them you'll see is rooted in the word. And that's why I'm going to put some scriptures on the screen like we always do. I'm going to talk about that, rooted in the word. But um, one of the other ones, and I think it's the first one you see as you're walking. I'm not sure. But uh, another one of our values is led by the spirit. And so as we look at the word, we want to try to understand what it means, what it meant then at the time, kind of the, the education, so to speak, that aspect. But even more, we're asking the question as we're led by the Spirit, what does this mean for us right now? How is God speaking to us? You guys have all come from somewhere how is God speaking to you through his word? Um, that is perhaps the bigger question as we look at God's word together. So with that said, we had been doing a series on the book of Acts, and now we're picking it up in chapter 11, and we're asking that question. What does it mean, but even more so, Lord, this passage in the book of Acts, how are you speaking to us so actually, before I'm going to read it, I'm actually going to pray now, Lord. Lord, um, Lord, help our minds focus on you and help us have a posture of leaning in as if to hear from you, as if you are speaking to us all individually, Lord. Together, yes, but also individually, Lord. Speak to us all. Speak to us together. Speak to us Speak to us, Lord. We want to hear from you as we're led by the Spirit, Lord. Allow my words... Allow my, allow my words to be empowered by you, Lord, um, led by you, led by your spirit, Lord, and let your word come alive and speak to us, Lord. We, we have come here to worship you in spirit and truth, Lord, and we need, we're hungry for you. We need our hearts renewed in you and who you are, and um, we want to be your hands and your feet, Lord, so empower us. And guide me now, guide us now. In your name, Jesus, amen. Okay, so Acts chapter 11. That's where we're picking it up. Acts chapter 11, again, verse 1. The apostles and the believers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him and said, you went into the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them. Okay, so again, rooted in the word. Let's understand what's going on here a little bit at least because there is kind of a lot that we could explain about this little thing that's happening right here. Peter, one of the apostles, Peter... Um, you know, sent by Jesus to do ministry. Peter is being criticized. Peter is being criticized by, it says here, by the, um, by the circumcised believers. He's being criticized because he went and he ate. He went into the home and he ate with uncircumcised men. 
What is that all about? What does that have to do with you and I? Uh, well, the uh, how much do I go into this? Um, the thing about the thing that was happening at the time is so circumcision was something that was a custom of the Jewish people, and it was more than a custom. It was something Moses told them to do, God told them to do, and it was a symbol of something. And part of that was, part of that custom, and in, in, in a sense, part of that law was to be separate, to be separate from people who are not. So on one hand, this is kind of a theological question, okay? The, the circumcised believers, which m means the Jewish, they were Jews, but they were also Christians. They believed in Jesus. The circumcised, the Jewish Christians were criticizing Peter, who was also a Jewish Christian. They were criticizing him because he seemed to break the Old Testament rules and he was, he was hanging out, he was eating together with Gentiles, with non-Jews, with uncircumcised men. And once more, there is a theological question, but most of my focus is not really on today on the theological aspect. You can, you can do your own research. I actually am more interested in the broader question, not so much the theological question, um, because it's, it is a theological problem being addressed, but it's a natural problem. Hear this, okay? What is going on right here is the most natural and normal. It is a natural and normal thing that is stirring up in these circumcised believers, okay? In these Jewish Christians. There's something very natural. It's a problem. There's something very natural and normal that is happening. It is so natural, so natural and not good at all. <laughs> um, and that probably deserves a little explanation because we usually say, we often say that those things that are natural are good. And that is often many times true. There are many things in nature that are beautiful and they show who God is, and we like things that are natural. And the little can of water that I was carrying around earlier, little bubbly water that you see me with a lot, it says on it, natural flavors. And we're like, yes, you know, it's not artificial, it's real, it's natural. And so very often we say what is natural is good. But it's not always good. <laughs> if you know the Bible and you know humanity, you know that there are times where that which is natural is not good at all. So I have four daughters, one of my daughters, I'm not going to say which one, I guess you have a 25% chance of being right if you guess, but one of my daughters, when she was so young, just, just barely old enough to sit up. So we're talking like in the crib, in the pack and play, not at all talking yet, not nowhere close to that. So, so very, very, very young, she was in her little pack and play with her little friend, okay? She had a, another baby that was actually born on the same day, a friend of ours. And she picked up a wooden, wooden block, Aaron? Get my facts. She picked up a wooden block and she hit her friend in the head with it, which wouldn't be so big of a deal, but all the adults who were there and saw it were shocked because they saw the look on her face and they knew that she knew exactly what she was doing. <laughs> there was no question uh, in her very young brain about uh, what was all happening. What we were seeing in this very young child was something that was very, very natural, not good. And let me just tell you this, as a parent, <laughs> it becomes less cute as they get older, okay? All right, a a as a parent and also just a as, a as a person, I've lived it, okay? Um, my kids, being pastor's kids, sometimes they get the short end of the stick with, with uh, <laughs> you know, having stuff pointed out. But really, this is, this is, this is universal. There are very, things that are very natural that are not good, and, and sometimes, Sometimes we find ourselves in the habit of justifying something that shouldn't be justified because it is natural. And, and you hear things like that, you know, boys will be boys, things like that, where it's like, um, 
yeah, it's maybe natural what you're seeing, but that doesn't mean it's good. And more recently, sometimes I'll hear people say things and I'll hear intellectuals say uh, monogamy is not natural. And um, it's, not, it's not natural to, to promise love and then to, to keep that promise throughout your life and, and sacrifice yourself. That's not natural. And I'm actually not here today to argue about marriage or to talk about things like that. All that to say is, I hope you can understand that there are things that are, that are deeply um, normal and natural for us that are, 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 not, that are, that are not, not good. Actually, myself, I come from a long line of um, addicts. There's a lot of addicts in my family line, and, and uh, you know, biologists will tell you that those things can be handed down genetically. That's a predisposition. There are things about our nature that are broken. And actually, actually, if you read the Bible, uh, depending on what translation you are using, you might see something called the flesh. Okay, that's how it is in a lot of translations, the flesh. But I think the NIV actually says the sinful nature. Okay, I don't know if you've heard, I hope you've heard, this is kind of something in the Bible, we're all sinners. And part of what that means is we have something in us that's very natural, very normal, very natural, that's not good. It's universal, um, the sinful the sinful nature, there's something natural that's not good. And so, all that to say, there's a reason why I brought you down that little um, explanation. This whole thing about, there's a symbol here. Circumcision, it was a, it was a symbol, it was a ritual, but, but, but it was a sign. It was a symbol given to the Jews. And it was supposed to communicate something. So I don't want to get into the graphic nature of what circumcision is, but it is the removal of something that is naturally there, okay? It's the removal of something natural to, to expose something, and it's, it's pointing at something. There is something natural that needs to be removed. There's something natural that's not good, not helpful. And again, it's just a symbol. It's, it's not about what is, it, it's, I, I, I'm, I hate. Circumcision physically is not really, uh, uh, something that is uh, neither circumcision nor circumcision counts for anything. We read that in the New Testament, so don't go there with your mind. I'm not advocating you know, anything other than what the symbol is trying to point out. There is something natural that is not good that, that needs to be removed. And I've told you, I've told you that we're all sinners. I, I hope you've understood that or heard that. But hear this, hear this. Our sin is not actually in itself what keeps us from God. As in the times we lose our temper, the times we give in to temptation, the times we make selfish decisions, you know, that is not actually what keeps us from God. What keeps us from God is the way that we cover it up in our hearts, the way we hide from those truths. If you've not known that God is a God who loves to forgive, that's who he is. That's who Jesus is. So Jesus was, was sent to be a God who would forgive us. He loves us and he forgives us. And so what keeps us from him is not the sinful choices we make, it's the way that we cover it. And so this concept of circumcision, it was, it was about removing, removing the covering. Because that ultimately is what God needs from his people. We need to be people who are not trying to cover our sin ourselves, but instead to be united with God and to walk with him and to know him and have him know us and to not hide it. And that leads to a question, how is it that we naturally try to hide? How do we naturally try to hide our sin? And that is, that's what pride is. Pride. And we could, of course, talk about like, we could, we could talk about 
you know, the internal work of pride and what's actually happening there. But that's on a heart level. There is something that goes on in the heart where you're not actually looking to God for forgiveness and life. And that, that is pride. But it has an external manifestation. Um, I'll try to make this more clear. Because what we're reading here is, is that. Um, the way that pride shows itself. Pride is what keeps us from God. The way that pride shows itself is in an identity that we carry. A posture. A life posture. A sense of self. Okay? You know what I mean when I say identity? Like, who am I? Who are we? There is a sense of self and a collective sense of self that can either stand on God and his goodness and his promises or can stand on pride. And let me tell you what, when you stand on pride, let me tell you what that is essentially saying, how it manifests. It manifests in this. We're the good guys. And, and they're the bad guys. Okay, you might not use those words, but that's how it is manifested. And one of the things I love about our church is we are, are, are a church, and many of us have come from all around the world. There are many cultures and backgrounds and nations represented here. I myself am an immigrant, although I didn't come from very far away, just south of the border. And... Let me tell you, oh wow, if you watch the news, you know this. Let me tell you, like my people, okay, uh, at this unique United States, my people, they are split. It's very, very tribal. It's a very, very us versus them. And this is the world that I came out of. Um, when I say we're the good guys, what I mean is there's a mentality that says we're the good guys the way we think is better than the way they think. Our customs are better than their customs. Our, our perspectives are better than theirs. Our political perspectives are better than theirs. Our religion, better than theirs. It's a posture. We are better. Now, I'm not advocating some sort of like relativism where there's no truth, but I am talking about a posture in which we can stand, in which we say, we're the good guys. And my, oh my, that sort of very normal, very natural, it is so very natural, that kind of natural tribalism, us versus them, it's consuming the land that I came from. And I would bet that if you have some insight, you can see how this is at work where you've, where you've come from and where you live. It's not a question of whether or not this is at play. It's really just a question of how. Because this is natural. This is very natural. This is very normal. We naturally want to have an identity that we can feel good about. Right? Of course we do. We want to feel like we're good and important. How do you walk through life feeling like you're something that is not good. You got, you, got to, you got to fix that somehow. You got to make sense of that in your heart. And so one of the things we can easily do is take on this posturing. We're the good guys. They're the bad guys. And that is how humankind has worked for some time now. And what's interesting here is... They're talking about circumcised believers versus uncircumcised believer, uncircumcised people. They're talking about people who have the covering and people who don't. But the very thing that they're expressing, you shouldn't eat with those people. We're better than them. We're the good guys. They're not. The very thing they're expressing is the heart attitude that is still circumcised, right? They're expressing that heart attitude that says, we're on the good team, and you're not supposed to hang out with the people on the bad team because it blurs the lines. And these lines are really important. And Well, here's something about Jesus. Jesus loved. Okay, 
Jesus loved to challenge this. Do you know what got people really upset with Jesus? He didn't play along with the lines that they drew. And in fact, he confronted it in lots of ways. Lots of ways. Um, He would regularly get criticized for eating with sinners. Uh, You know, and, and when he did that, when he would eat with sinners, the reason that would get people angry, when I say sinners, people who are known sinners, okay, prostitutes, bad guys, okay, the people that were looked at as bad guys, he would eat with them. And the reason that got people upset is when you eat with them, it's almost as if you don't agree that we're the good guys. And it's true. He didn't agree. There is a truth that is supposed to level the playing field. And what is it? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely as a gift. Jesus died for the world. He wasn't just the savior of the Jews. For all have sinned, Jew and Gentile alike. And we all need the same forgiveness. What does it say? Romans chapter 2, verse 1. When you condemn someone else, when you judge someone else, you're condemning yourself because you do the same things. Meaning we are all of the same nature. Do you know that? We are all of the same natural heart. And so if we're going to stand and look down on others, they're of the same flesh. We're judging ourselves. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And Jesus came to give us an identity that this tribal way of thinking could never do. Because all of that is based on on lies and illusion. But Jesus came to give us an identity that is actually good and based on truth. Oh, there's this, there's this one time, and I forget what, what, what passage of scripture it is. But Jesus is coming into town, and there's this big crowd, right? There's this big crowd, and this guy named uh, Zacchaeus, he's climbing a tree. Zacchaeus, he's climbing a tree because he's short, and he wants to see what's going on, and he's a tax collector. So tax collectors were the worst because the tax collectors also... The tax collectors also, they didn't affirm the line in the sand. You know, there was this line in the sand, like, we're the good guys, they're the bad guys. And for the Jews, it was like, we, the Jews, are the good guys, and the Romans are the bad guys. And the tax collectors were Jews who were working for the Romans to collect money. So they were like traitors. They were like hated. They were hated. And Jesus, in front of everyone, in front of the crowd, in front of the crowd, Jesus says... Zacchaeus, I want to go to your house and have a meal with you. And that was so perplexing to the people. But Jesus is making a statement here. The Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. And so Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus, uh, actually, okay, I'm going to tell you this story. (laughs) I'm going to tell you this story. Because it fits in here. Zacchaeus. Um, okay. <laughs> okay. So, uh, where's my wife? She disappeared. Oh, whatever. She's probably floating around doing some task that needs to happen. Uh, so, on Thursday, Aaron and I uh, got tickets to see, like, One of my favorite bands, like maybe my favorite, I don't know. We got tickets to see uh, 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 Switchfoot and John Foreman, the the lead singer. He's got solo stuff uh, and the band, I just love the band. Um, And uh, uh, we got to the part of town where the concert was going to be at and then we... Wanted to get a bite to eat, and we walked for a while. We, we got lost. We went too far. We 
turned around, we were looking for a certain restaurant, we found the restaurant, but there was just a takeout place. They didn't have tables, so we walked down and found another restaurant. They also didn't seem to have any tables. And then we're like, okay, we gotta find a place to eat now. Here's some outdoor tables right here, kind of off on this side street, and there's no one else there, and the waitress is like, yeah, you can sit down there. And so we sit down, order some food, and I'm wearing this old t-shirt because we saw this band like 10 or 15 years ago. I'm wearing this old t-shirt. I actually ironed it before we went out because I'm like, I'm like, this t-shirt hasn't been worn in forever. I was like, but I'm gonna wear my old band t-shirt. And uh, we're sitting there on this quiet side street and the waitress comes out with two other customers, two other people looking to get some food. And he looks at me like he knows me He's actually looking at my shirt, and so I look at him, and that's John Foreman. <laughs> that's the lead singer of Switchfoot, and, um, and I was like, whoa! And, uh, and Aaron turns around, and I was like, whoa! You know, and uh, of course, he just recognized my shirt, and then the waitress was like, oh, uh, you guys know each other here? You can sit together, and it's like, um, Okay, so they had this table right next to us, and it was like, okay, I guess we're eating dinner with John Foreman and, uh, and, um, and, and his drummer, Chad, and, and we talked about all you know, sorts of stuff. I was actually super nervous, like fanboy, you know, like uh, making a fool out of myself whenever I talk. My wife, totally cool. She's just chatting up, <laughs> chatting them up the whole time and, you know, talking about her whatever, coming to Montreal, and they're talking about, you know, life touring, and, uh, you know, uh, showing, they're asking about our tattoos, and, you know, I told them this one song that I really like that they do, um, and uh, anyways, then they, then they had to leave, you know, to go to the show, of course, sound check, and then the waitress comes back, I'm like, do you know who that was? And she's like, no, I thought you guys knew each other. It's like, no. <laughs> um, anyways, uh, so that was that was Thursday, and then they they go to the they go they left of course, and then later you know we get to the concert, and the concert was great, the music was amazing, and then like the last song before they left the stage, you know, uh, uh, John was like, yeah. So before the show, me and Chad were. Uh, looking for something to eat, and he tells a story how he met us, and he's like, yeah, and we. He's like, we had this double date, and thanks for the double date, guys. And, you know, Charlie wanted to hear this song, or I don't remember what he said. He's like, so he played the song that I asked. And I was like, I can't believe this is happening. And it was like, here's, 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 here's my point of how it ties in. That felt good, right? Why did that feel good? Because now, Aaron and I, now I'm the guy who just had a meal with John Foreman. Like, none of the people in this room know anything about me, but they know that. And that's an honor, isn't it? Yeah, 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 we, we had dinner together. That was, that's an honor. Check this, check this. Zacchaeus, tax collector. Filthy, awful tax collector, right? Guess what? None of that matters anymore, does it? Because now who is Zacchaeus? Yeah, Jesus came in my house, and we ate together. And that's what you need to know about me. And guess what, my friends? That's the honor, that's the identity that he wants to give us. We don't have to break into our tribal group saying, we're better than you, you know. We don't have to do that. Because Jesus is giving us an identity that is good and an identity that has honor to be a friend of God. To be a friend of God. You have a background, you have mistakes and sins, as do I. But Jesus wants to eat with us. That's who he is. And so anyways, that is what happened. And then after Jesus left, Jesus sent Peter to do the same thing. And, and when Ryan preached a, a month or so ago, maybe two months, he talked about that whole thing that happened when Peter was sent to the Gentiles. And here, um, Peter's getting criticized. They, they heard that Peter went and ate with uncircumcised people. And he's getting 
criticized. So let's actually just see how is Peter responding to that criticism. In verse 4, starting from the beginning, Peter told them the whole story. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. I saw something like a large sheep being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to where I was. I looked into it and saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, reptiles, and birds. Then I heard a voice telling me, get up, Peter, kill and eat. I replied, surely not, Lord. Nothing impure or unclean has ever entered my mouth. The voice spoke from heaven a second time. Do not call anything impure that the Lord has made clean. This happened three times, and then it was all pulled up to heaven again. Okay, this is, this is actually really helpful for us. Peter is getting criticized by the, the... He's getting criticized. Why did you eat with those people? And so now Peter has to defend himself. What does he do? Verse 4, again, starting from the beginning, Peter told them the whole story. What he did was he just told them what happened. Um, when, with our young adults this week, uh, you know, the questions, topics we talk about, someone wrote on the board, you know, like how often are we, are we preaching the gospel? How often should we in our daily lives be like preaching the gospel, telling other people about Jesus? And I had to kind of challenge the wording a little bit in the sense of, well, yes, we all have a calling, but we're not all called technically to preach the gospel, okay? What we're called and we're, what we're sent out to do is to bear witness, to acknowledge him, and simply just talk about what happened. When the opportunity arises and when God gives you that opportunity and you can ask for that opportunity and he'll put you in that circumstance to tell what happened. But that's really all it. You, what does the scripture say? You will receive power. Oh, Lord, do it. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and you'll be able to share what happened. That's, that's it. Just, just speaking the truth. Just speaking the truth as God prompts you and leads you. That's all Peter did. Was like, all right, I'll tell you what happened. And, and um, oh, actually, our neighbor groups are going to start soon. God willing, they're going to start soon. And for the first couple months, we're really going to be focusing on developing for all of us, hearing one another's stories. Hearing one another's stories, sharing one another's stories, and, and learning about our own story. Because this is such a powerful tool for our witnessing, for our ministry. It's also going to tie the groups together, give you a chance to get to know one another. But even more so, it's going to empower you and strengthen you as we've all been called to be witnesses. And you might be thinking, well, I don't really have a story. You do. You do have a story. And maybe that story is not done yet as it's all being written. But... There is something about stepping back and realizing, yes, God has been leading you. God has a plan for you. He's been leading you. And if you don't see that, you will see that. All right? And by the way, if you haven't signed up for neighbor groups yet, go on a web page and do it. Doesn't, it doesn't matter who you are, where you come from. Let me just say this. You don't have to be a Christian, just so we're clear on that. You don't have to be a Christian to sign up for neighbor groups. Like, we mean it. Uh, all are welcome. So anyways, uh, anyways, uh, Peter just tells him what happened. And look at this verse, uh, verse 8. When he had this vision, it's, he says, you know, the vision says, get up and eat some food, which was a, a symbol for, like, he, he, had, he saw this, like, non-kosher food, and he's like, go and eat it, which was a symbol for the, the Gentiles. And he's like, no, I would never do such a thing. And this is important. Peter is doing something actually very smart and, and honest. Peter is not sugarcoating it, and Peter is not making himself look better. Peter's not the hero of this story, and actually, Peter is identifying with his audience. Like, you guys think this is weird and crazy that I went and ate with those people? Trust me, I know where you're coming from, because when I had this vision, that was my same reaction. I was like, I would never do such a thing. So Peter is not like responding, he's not preaching down to them, okay? He's bearing witness and he's identifying with them, like, guys, I know what it's like. I know what it's like, I know what you're thinking. That's just, that's just 
a good way to connect with people. Be honest. As we're called to share our stories, don't make yourself look better. Sometimes the most powerful thing you can do is acknowledge how you are someone who needed your thinking changed. Okay, I was going this way, I was totally wrong, and God showed me a better way, you know? Anyways, um, oh, this is something else. This is good, this is good. This is helpful for us right now. Peter said this. I was in the city of Joppa praying. I was praying, and then he had this vision while he was praying. I think one of the things, perhaps the thing that keeps us from prayer is we have too low of an expectation of God. What does the scripture say? Draw near to me, says the Lord. Draw near to him and he will draw near to you. Draw near to him and he will draw near to you. When you pray, are you expecting God to meet you there? While I was praying, I had this vision. Oh, oh, this week, this week. Hear this. This week we had an elder meeting. And going to the elder meeting, my heart was heavy. Because for months, for months, I've been talking with all of you and telling you all to sign up for neighborhood groups. And we got a bunch of people signed up and now we have to try to put it into place. And I have so much worries of like, Are these groups going to be groups filled with the Holy Spirit with power? Or are they just going to be like awkward meetings that we're forcing people into a room and they don't really want to be there and it's just going to fizzle out? Lord, are you going to do something awesome? Lord, oh, we need you to do something awesome. Please help us bring this together. We're so close. But we we need you to do it. I'm going into this and I'm just so, I'm feeling just the fears that are just part of our nature, you know? And, uh, And we were praying. While they were praying, something happened. We were praying as elders. And as we were praying, Chris Piazza, sorry, Chris, but uh, as we were praying, Chris Piazza, and I've actually never heard him pray like this, Chris says, while praying, he says, I see a runway and it's lit up. And I've never heard him share, actually, that would be what you would call like a prophecy, like something from God. He said, I see a runway and it's lit up. He said that while we were praying. And the full power behind that actually didn't hit me until the next day. He said, I see a runway and it's lit up. And the next day I was telling Aaron that. And as I was telling her, I remembered. Yesterday morning before our meeting, I saw this headline. I saw this headline in the news and I didn't click on it, but I saw this headline about how there's this airport that is so difficult to land that only 50 pilots in the whole world are certified to land there. And I, and I went back and I found, and I found the article and, and apparently this, it's an international airport, it's right between like these mountains and, and you have to curve around and come at a steep dive and apparently you can't even see the runway until you are about to land on it. And, 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 I, and, I, and I saw that headline, and I forgot about it. And then I went into this elder meeting, and while we were praying, Chris said, I see a runway lit up. And let me just tell you this. This is God's word for us. I believe this. He's going to land this plane. He's going to land this plane. By faith, I've been saying that there is a fire burning and God is going to spread out this fire and he's going to add more fuel and it's going to burn. He's going to land this plane. Let's keep going. Verse 11. Right then, three men who had been sent to me from Caesarea stopped at the house where I was staying. The Spirit told me to have no hesitation about going with them. These six brothers also went with me, and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen an angel appear in his house and say, Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He will bring you a message through which you and all your household will be saved. Um, Do you guys know that we've all been sent? We've all been sent by God. To, to, to be his witnesses, to shine the light. Here's something Jesus said. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And beloved, there is a joy when you are walking in this calling. 
This is our purpose until he returns. And beloved, if you don't accept this purpose and embrace this purpose, the devil will give you a different purpose. We are, are vacuums. Our hearts are vacuums for purpose. If you don't have a purpose, you're, you, you're not going to have any sense. And you'll probably just cling to a purpose that in the end won't actually satisfy. We have been sent by him. And is this hard? Is this difficult? Well, yeah, at, yeah, at, at times it is. Because we're weak and we worry. I worry or, 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 or we doubt. In those ways, it's difficult. But beloved, when you read this, I actually want you to see how easy this is. How easy this is. Peter was sent, and Peter was sent by Jesus, and he's saying, hey, I was praying, I had a vision, and then I saw these people, and the Holy Spirit told me to go with them. Meanwhile, on their end, on their end, there was an angel that was showing up and, and speaking to them. All Peter did was just, it was like the easiest thing in the world. You just, you just take the next step that's in front of you. He just puts the step out. It's very clear what the next step is. He just walked in it. Um, God is working in places that we can't see. In our neighbors, in our coworkers, the people that God is sending us to, he's working on their end also. And just catch this, catch this. You know, Jesus said it, it's John chapter 20. As the Father is sending as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And then what did he do? What's the very next thing that he did? As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Oh, how wonderful that we've not been sent on this mission ourselves. Do you long for a life of power? Do you long for a life of, of, of anointing, of miraculous stories of God speaking through friends of yours? And, and, and like just what I just shared? Do you long for a life where the Holy Spirit is leading you? It's an adventure. Do you long for that? Then join his mission. Hear the calling. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And beloved, these neighborhood groups that I'm very, very excited about, we're going to get together and eat, but it's not just about eating together. And we're going to look at the Bible, and it's not just about reading the Bible together. These are mission groups. These are groups that we are going to come together for the purpose of mission, to pray together, and to ask for God's wisdom together and how he's leading us. It's, it's, it's part of our missionary work. And beloved, once more, this is a purpose that brings joy. This is the purpose that his Holy Spirit will empower as the Father is sending me, I'm sending you. Receive the Spirit. Oh, Jesus, let us receive your Spirit, more of your Spirit. Fill us. Fill us to the brim and make us excited to serve you. Make us excited for the mission that you're going to lead us on, Lord. Do it. Do it, Lord. Land the plane. Verse 15, let's keep going. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as he had come on us at the beginning. He's just telling his story. Then I remembered what the Lord had said. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave them the same gift he gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could stand in God's way? When they heard this, they had no further objections and praised God, saying, so then, even to Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. This is beautiful. This is beautiful. Once more, Peter is acknowledging, guys, I was just like you. And it really is a hard-hearted perspective. He's talking to people who are being judgmental. They're looking down on others. He's talking to people who are still kind of blinded in pride. And beloved, we're all in this process of having our eyes further opened. So I'm not saying these people weren't real believers, but I'm saying that they had some hardness of heart at play. 
They needed God to soften their hearts and open their eyes. And Peter is identifying with that. He's saying, even as I saw the Holy Spirit fall on them, I thought, who am I to stand in the way? Like he's saying, there was a part of me that still didn't like that. I, I wanted to hold to this idea that we're the good guys, you know? And the way that Peter told them what happened, he just shared the story with humility. He just shared the story with humility, and look what happened. This is the miraculous thing that we can't do. Verse 18, when they heard this, they had no further objections and praised God. They went from looking down on those people to praising God for their inclusion. That's a heart change. That's a heart change when you can love the people that you previously had contempt for. That is the healing that God is doing in our world. Oh, Lord, do it here. Give us a true, authentic, burning, powerful love for those who are outside, Lord, that we want to see them come in. We want to see them know you. Lord, do it, God, do it. This is the repentance that leads to life, Lord. Do it. Work in our hearts. Work through our neighborhood groups, Lord, and do it, Lord. We ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen.